Fletcher. I'm an actress and an author, and I'm about to read to you the first two chapters of my first ever children's novel, Into the Spotlight. It's inspired by Noel Stretfield's ballet shoes and endorsed by her estate, and I've written it in celebration of the Puffin 80th anniversary and the 150th anniversary of Noel's birth. Into the Spotlight. Chapter one, Lost and Found. The Pebble children lived underneath Chelsea Bridge. Well, they lived underneath the railway arches next to Chelsea Bridge, which is closer to Pimlico, but it felt fancier for them to say they lived in Chelsea. It was much too far to walk to the Natural History Museum to see the dinosaurs, but close enough to the Battersea Park Children's Zoo for them not to complain too much. Not that they often complained. The Pebbles were very contented children. After all, what children wouldn't be content when living in a theatre? A theatre was a wonderful place to live. It was filled with the most interesting people, especially Pebble Theatre. It was called this because from wall to wall, top to bottom, it was covered in pebbles collected from seasides all over the world by someone they called Bam. Bam told me this one is her favourite because when you tilt your head and squint a bit, it looks like Elvis Presley, said Marigold, the eldest Pebble child. All three children tilted their heads and squinted, but only Marigold really knew what Elvis Presley had looked like. Bam, by the way, is the fastest way the children had found to say brilliant Aunt Maud. Great Aunt Maud, Bam had scoffed when called Great Aunt Maud by her great niece Lydia. I'm better than great. I'm brilliant, she trilled as she flourished her long pointed bright red nails round her short curled silver hair. Bam owned Pebble Theatre, and she travelled the world looking for the world's finest talent to bring back to perform on its stage. She'd found contortionists, opera singers, playwrights and magicians. The weirder the talent, the more excited Bam got. However, she never went anywhere without finding a seaside town or a beach and searching for a pebble to bring home and add to her collection. There were pale pink ones that were pointed and jagged and looked like the teeth of a ferocious sea creature. There was a shiny green one that Morris could stare at for hours, hypnotised by the way it sometimes turned orange if the light hit it just right. There were ones so blue they looked like little pieces of the ocean. Bam brought them home and stuck them to the walls of the theatre. There were pebbles of all colours, shapes and sizes absolutely everywhere. They were even on the ceiling. Bam had created a wondrous seaside cavern. However, her favourite additions to her collection were the young Marigold, Mabel and Morris. Twelve years ago, Bam found herself on Varkala Beach in India, looking out at the ocean, feeling peaceful and at ease with herself despite the hot sun beating down upon her shoulders. Her already wrinkled skin was beginning to crackle and peel, but Bam was just pleased to be out of the cold English rain. Suddenly, a violent wave crashed onto the shore, shaking Bam out of her calm days. A basket gently rolled out of the water and washed up at her feet. Just before the tide pulled it back into the ocean, Bam took hold of the basket's handle and lifted it away. However, the weight of it took her by surprise. At first, Bam thought it was only filled with pretty orange flowers, but as the sound of the crashing waves died down, she could now hear the sound of a soft wailing. Bam crouched in the wet sand, careful not to let her dress touch the water, and there, in amongst the marigolds, was the beautiful face of a baby. Her eyes were golden like the flowers that surrounded her and without thinking, Bam lifted the child to her chest and cradled her until she hushed its cries. She tried hard to locate the child's parents but eventually found that they had drowned when their boat went down at sea. Brilliant Aunt Maud wasn't able to leave the darling girl behind and so officially adopted her, but without telling her great niece. When she arrived home with more than just luggage, Lydia was less than calm. A baby, Lydia cried as brilliant Aunt Maud crashed through the stage door of the theatre, dragging her case with one arm and cradling a baby in the other. Lydia took the child from her, her mouth flapping open and closed, unable to believe she was actually holding an infant in her arms. Yes, I'm quite certain that's what it is, said Bam as she removed her coat, happy to be home. Of course I know it's a baby, but whose baby is it? And what's it doing here? The baby began to wake in her arms and, like a natural, Lydia began to coo and rock her back and forth. Oh, well, I thought you could look after her. I've named her Marigold after the flower she was lying in when I found her. 
And that was the end of the conversation. Lydia knew there was little else that could be said to persuade her brilliant Aunt Maud otherwise. Marigold was now part of the family. Next came Mabel. When Marigold was two, Bam had been called away to Portobello Beach in Scotland. Her cousin Bartholomew lived there and he was not well. In fact, he was not very well at all. After Bartholomew's wife passed away, Bam was the only family he had left, and Bam had managed to get to his bedside just in time for Bartholomew to place his baby daughter in her care before he closed his eyes for the last time. His passing was only eased by the little girl he left behind. A little girl who looked so much like her father that Bam felt a lump in her throat every time she looked into her eyes. It's best that she's with family said Bam, wiping tears from her cheeks as she carefully passed the bundle to Lydia. You did the right thing, Lydia said, but as she looked down at the sleeping child, she caught sight of a flash of red underneath the blanket. She uncovered the baby's head and the brightest red curls pinged out in one great burst. The little girl wriggled, then opened her eyes to reveal they were a deep green. Lydia was lost immediately. Does she have a name? Mabel named after a character in my cousin's favourite musical. As in Mac and Mabel. Exactly, Bam smiled. And that was the end of the conversation. Lydia knew there was little else to be said. Mabel was now a part of the family. Last but not least, Morris appeared. He was the only child that found Bam before Bam had the chance to find him. One cold November morning when the sun had barely risen, Bam made her way from their home above the theatre, through the corridors, past dressing rooms, past the stage, and into the front of the building. She often liked to do this. When no one was around, she would nip outside to look up at the theatre that she'd worked so hard for. She would stand with her hands on her hips and revel in the pride that rose all the way up from her tummy to where it would shine out of her face in a smile. A smile that was almost as bright as the sign that told the world that this was the Pebble Theatre. On this particular day, however, before she opened the door to the theatre, she noticed there was a red shoebox sitting on the steps. Hurriedly, she turned the key in the lock and skittered out in her slippers, pulling her dressing gown round her. Her breath puffed out of her mouth in the chilly air. As she bent over the shoebox, she saw that it did not contain the pair of trainers it might once have done, but instead a tiny wriggling human. The poor thing was freezing to the touch. Bam quickly scooped up the baby, shoebox and all, and ran back inside, screaming for Lydia. What's all the fuss? What is it? Lydia ran out of the bedroom and into the kitchen, rubbing her eyes. Here, Bam had settled the shoebox on the table and was now holding the baby as close to her as possible, willing her own warmth into its tiny body. It's a little boy, Bam said, out of breath from the commotion. Not again, sighed Lydia, feeling as though she was stuck in a time warp. Now you can't pin the blame on me, Lydia. This one found me. Where did he come from, I wonder? Lydia asked. But as she picked up the shoebox, a small letter fluttered out from between its folded cardboard edges. Oh, Lydia read it aloud. If found, please do not return. There are some cruel people out there. A sob caught in Lydia's throat. Or desperate people, Bam said gently, shaking her head. Not to worry. He's one of us now. Was there a name in the letter? Lydia turned the paper over in her hands to make certain, but it was just the one simple line scrawled across the page. No, I'm afraid not. Then it's down to me again. How about... The cogs in Bam's head began to turn. Lydia peered into the bundle. His skin was dark and now warming up under Bam's embrace and his cheeks were so round Lydia had a sudden urge to squeeze them between her fingers. Before Bam could think of a suitable name, Lydia made a suggestion of her own. A name that belonged to her great uncle, Bam's late husband. A man who had the warmest hugs, the kindest eyes and always saw the best in people. How about Morris? Lydia said. Bam looked from Lydia to the wispy-haired cherub in her arms and back to Lydia. Bam's breath caught, but she quickly swallowed down the lump of feelings that had formed in her throat. Marigold, Mabel and Morris, Bam grinned. And that was the end of the conversation. Morris was now part of the family 
and he was the last child to find his way to the Pebble Theatre. Chapter two, a name for ourselves. Lydia worked at the Pebble Theatre as the stage manager. A stage manager is someone awfully clever who is in charge of just about everything that goes on backstage. She was responsible for lots of things, including organising rehearsals and arranging costume and wig fittings for all of the actors. Then when the show was finally up and running, Lydia kept it running. She made sure everyone had their props on time, queued entrances and exits, and even made everyone tea in the interval. On top of all that, she also looked after the three children when Bam was on her travels, which was more often than not. Lydia, said three-year-old Morris, as he curled up on Bam's niece's lap, it was bedtime, and Lydia had just read them their story, but the three children were not tired and knew that the best way to stay up late was to ask Lydia lots of questions that needed very long, complicated answers. Lydia, do you think Bam has forgotten us? Morris pouted. I should hope not. That would mean she's also forgotten about me, and I'm far too amazing to be forgotten, aren't I? Lydia tickled Morris until he told her just how amazing she was. Lydia had dark chocolate-coloured hair that blended in with the black headset she had to wear when she was backstage. It had one big earphone that covered her right ear and a little microphone that curled round her cheek so that she could talk to people all over the theatre. The children saw her so often with her headset on that she looked strange at bedtime when she wasn't wearing it, rather like when you're so used to seeing someone wearing glasses that they almost look like a totally different person when they take them off at the end of the day. Lydia always took the headset off before entering the children's room, so her head wasn't filled with other people's voices and she could give them her full attention. Lydia, Mabel, who was now five, asked as she rested her little head on Lydia's knee. Mabel's burnt orange hair spilled over her face and Lydia smiled as she began to plait it ready for bed. It was almost as long as Mabel was tall and Lydia was always worried that she might get tangled up in it in the night. What's our last name? Now this was a much more serious question because Lydia didn't have an answer. Hmm, she said, concentrating on the plaiting. Well, let's see. You can have my last name if you like. It's Crawley. Like creepy Crawley, said Morris, scrunching up his nose. Mabel reached across to him and gave his arm a nudge. Sorry, Morris buried his head in Lydia's shoulder. Exactly like a creepy Crawley, she smiled. Okay, not Crawley. How about Cooper? That's Bam's last name. How about that? Morris and Mabel looked at each other and then at Marigold, who was sitting on her bed reading her own book. Marigold was seven and the two younger siblings felt it was her responsibility to deny taking Cooper as their last name. Being the eldest made Marigold the most responsible and the other two looked up to her. She had wise eyes and a quiet nature, which made Mabel and Morris both a little nervous. Cooper sounds a little bit, well, boring. Don't let Bam hear you say that, Lydia snorted. It's a good name, Marigold remedied. It just doesn't feel like it really belongs to us. Mabel and Morris nodded their agreement. Marigold closed her book and thought for a moment. What about Pebble, Marigold said. Morris and Mabel grinned at each other and then back at Marigold. Pebble, Lydia raised an eyebrow. After the theatre? Exactly. No one else will have a name like it. It'll be all our own. Morris and Mabel nodded enthusiastically, but looked wide-eyed to Lydia, whose face burst into a grin. I think it's a marvellous idea. After all, you are Bam's favourite addition to her collection. It only seems right that you all be pebbles. The children all jumped to their feet and shouted, Hooray! How do you do? I'm Marigold Pebble, said Marigold, holding out her hand, which Lydia shook. She danced out of the way and the others followed suit. How do you do? I'm Mabel Pebble. Mabel almost couldn't speak for laughter. How do you do? Morris bellowed. I'm Morris Pebble and my sisters and I have the best name on planet Earth. The newly appointed pebbles collapsed into a giggling heap on the floor, happiness pouring out of them, feeling a little more complete than they did before. If you like that video, there are loads more talks, classes, and exclusive videos from the Happy Place Virtual Festival. So don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, 
Do follow us on Instagram for constant updates and enjoy.